afternoon to everyone who is uh, here in our webinar right now. Thank you, of course, for your time and for your interest in joining. And um, of course, for wanting to know more about our student exchange program in which will be our main sharing session topic for today. So our sharing session topic is uh, foreign students in Indonesia and in Europe challenges while studying abroad during a pandemic. So this is very timely because we have um, an ongoing student exchange program and our guest speakers would speak and share clearly of um, the exact things that they are experiencing during the pandemic because one of our students, LSPR student, is um, in, uh, in, an, uh, in Europe right now, and one of our foreign students are is here in Indonesia right now. So first, I would like to remind everyone to please turn off your microphone during the whole session so that we won't disturb the session. And then second is that please feel free to drop your your any um, questions that is related to our student exchange program or you can address it directly to the speakers in our chat box while the discussion is ongoing so that the questions would be continuously received. All right, so um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator for today, which is, um, uh, I think we couldn't find any other <laughs> good uh, moderator to, to lead the guide questions to our um, guest for today because she is Adida Ayu Putri. She is an LSPR Erasmus Plus scholarship recipient to Zealand Academy of Technologies and Business in Denmark for the year 2018 to 2019. So you can call her Ka Putri. Um, Putri, the screen is yours. Hi everyone. As So I think we're just having a technical difficulty from Putri's side. So um, just to inform everyone um, that our student exchange program is uh, canceled for the September intake. And, but don't worry because there are a lot of other alternative options for our student exchange who is still willing to go abroad or you know our student exchange inbound coming to Indonesia. Because um, uh, number one, Dikti, uh, the education. Oh, there you go. Hi, <laughs> Putri, you're back. <laughs> All good? Oh, good. Yeah. yeah, I need to change to Miss Candy's computer. Sorry. <laughs> so you, know, you can get you can introduce right now our speakers. Okay, hi everyone. As Miss Nadine said before, uh, I'm Putri. Um, previously, I also went to Ziba to study there for six months. And today I also have the guest here who I'm studying in Ziba right now and another one from Netherlands. So one here I have Elena. Elena, the student exchange from the Hack University in Netherlands who I'm studying here. How many months have you been here? I think from the first two or three, something two like that. Cool. And you're still here in Indonesia? Yeah, until August. Until August. So she will experience also six months. And we have Iran here from LSPR student who's studying in Zibat now, or Zealand in Denmark. She's also the Erasmus recipient who study in Denmark for the spring semester this year. So 
I will continue with the question. The first question, of course, we want to know, what is your first impression when you arrive in the country, either in Indonesia or in Denmark? Because it's so different, right, in your home country. What is the differences? Your first impression. Maybe Iren can answer first. Okay. Um, so the first noticeable difference is obviously um, the climate, like the weather. Um, it is really cold there when I arrived, and that was awesome. Um, it comes to a surprise, really. It was like colder than I expected, but um, all is well. And um, it was also that um, I heard that they are more individualistic, that they don't really talk to strangers unless they are drunk for some reason. And um, yeah, and when I first arrived here, um, I was supposed to be picked up by a student buddy, like the exchange buddy, but um, she was unable to pick me up directly at the airport at that day, so I had to work myself out to go to the city where I'm staying, and so that was a challenge in itself, like, yeah, I had to ask around for um, to strangers for directions, but I was really lucky that that day I met a stranger that was really helpful. He helped me to go to the city where I'm staying at. So it was really nice. The strangers are actually really helpful when you need help, even though they don't really talk much. Um, and also another difference that I have um, realized is that um, they are really ordered. They keep, um, like, they obey the rules, they stay on their lines. Like for example, pedestrians have to walk in that exact lane, like bicycles have to go on that lane, cars can only go in this lane. Yeah. And also they are really punctual. So really you cannot be late here in Denmark. It's really different there. Yep. So this so is our kind of So you, you met the stranger to went to Roskill was killed from yeah. the Copenhagen airport. Yeah, from Copenhagen airport. Like he actually took me to the rescue. Ah, uh, that's nice. How about it's Elena? Really nice. really nice How do you feel when you arrive in Indonesia? Because I know it's so different with Netherlands. Yeah, it's really different, and I really had no idea what to expect. I hadn't done any research on how people behave. So when I got to the airport, I was so panicked because I was meeting my student buddy. And I was like, oh my God, how am I going to greet her? Like, do we shake hands? Do we hug? Do we kiss on the cheek? I was so panicked. And I met the two students who welcomed me, and they were so nice, and we were so similar in mindsets and just, like, yeah, behavior and attitudes. And it helped a lot to, like, relieve that stress and anxiety. Um, and then the traffic, oh my God, I think you hear this all the time, but the traffic was a shock. Uh, like how people drive and I was expecting an accident to happen any second, but it didn't. So that was great. Um, and then, oh yeah, Irene mentioned about uh, how people in Denmark are uh, punctual. And here in Indonesia, uh, that was a bit of a shock because I think you guys, yeah, <laughs> you like to take your time. Uh, so we had like, uh, I don't know, meetings in universities or we had to go somewhere and uh, we would have to wait a bit, which I personally don't mind. But uh, it is, yeah, it is a difference. Um, and then people are extremely, extremely nice and polite here. Um, like really helpful and they just always like have a bright smile on their faces and they want to help you and I appreciate that a lot. I mean, people are nice too in the Netherlands, but here they're even more welcoming and warm. So I, yeah, I really like that. So the people, it's like one of these three first your life, right? Like, I really feel the time there, and Alan feel like, oh, the traffic here is, is worse, right? Yeah, exactly. But it's been months since you've been in Indonesia or in Denmark. Did it change your perspective after your first, that was, that was your first impression. But after months, did it change it or, oh, okay, it's turned out, it's true that, that for example, Alan said the people in Indonesia is very nice, very friendly, but maybe after some months you find it's different or it's still, it's still the same. What do you think? Well, it's still the same. Um, still the same. It's not like my first impression changed drastically. But now, after a few months, I see a lot of similarities between 
because I'm originally from Romania. I study in the Netherlands. Um, and I see a lot of similarities between the people here and the people in Romania, which is weird. Uh, I wasn't expecting that. Um, I don't know, similarities in the way that um, we just, I feel like we just find a way, regardless of the situation, we adapt and uh, we make the best out of anything. So that's kind of what happened after a few months of being here. But genuinely, my first impressions did not change. Yeah. So it's the same, including the traffic, you still think it's... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> For sure. How about, how about it in there? Did it change it? Because um, usually, like you said before, Danish people, they don't, they tend not to talk, talk much. But after you know them, usually they are very talkative. What do you think about it? Yeah, it is actually um, like um, for the first impressions, it didn't really change much except for the people, of course. Um, and yeah, it was exactly what you said. Um, when they when you first meet them, you don't they don't really talk much. And I still find it the same if it's um, with strangers. But once you get to know them, yeah, they really don't really stop talking, which is yeah, it's pretty similar to Indonesia, actually. So yeah, it's not really something that is a shock, as much of a shock. Mm -hmm. That's about the people and the culture. Now I want to talk about, how about the weather? Because Elena, you feel from cold to here, as we know, even for, for us Indonesian, we feel it's so hot these days. And Irene, Denmark is so cold with the wind. How do you go with it? Did you feel, what, weather shock? Not culture shock, but weather shock? <laughs> I mean, um... Yeah, it's it's really hot. It's way hotter than where I come from. Um, but um, I mean, I was expecting that, and I kind of liked it because, to be honest, I spent my first two weeks in Indonesia in Bali, of course, like any tourist, and it was really nice. It was really nice to enjoy a bit of more, especially especially because in the Netherlands we don't really get summer. It's like a weekend with twenty something degrees, and that's it. So it was good. It felt like a nice little vacation. Actually, because of the weather, the whole stay feels like a, a nice little vacation. Um, and it's not that unbearable because we have air conditioning inside and in the malls and stores outside or the restaurants, same air conditioning. So it's, uh, it's really bearable. So yeah. How about you, right? The cold weather in Denmark? The cold weather, well, um... It is, yeah, it is really cold, as you said. Even when um, when I have worn, like, what, three, four layers of clothes, it was still cold, even when I was also wearing, like, a big-ass coat like that. Um, but, yeah, I got used to it after a few weeks. I, I became to accept my fate being cold all the time, basically. Um, and um, it is also really bearable because... Almost everything is done indoors, where they have heaters. So instead of air conditioners, we have heaters, which is really cool. At least we can stay warm on the inside. So I don't really go out much um, when it's cold. But um, one day we were doing like some city tours. There was um, one of the introduction week activities from the Zealand Academy. That was really a challenge. We were outside for hours in the cold, but it was really fun. And as I got to, um, you know, see other cool places, so it made the weather maybe like worth it, I guess. Seeing so many differences, but why you choose, I don't know, why you choose Indonesia and Iran? Why you just to go to Denmark in the first place? Because as we heard before, there are so many differences, but why you choose to go there or to come here? Um, when I was changing my study exchange country, I wanted something as different and far away as possible because it was, it seemed like a one life opportunity. Um, and yeah, I looked for a country that's super different and complex and, you know, Indonesia has so many islands and so many different languages and cultures. I thought that would really, really be a cultural experience for me. Um, so I think, yeah, that was kind of my, my main reason. And generally, I had never been out of Europe before coming here. Oh, so so I'm going to go big. Time. Yeah, my first time out of Europe. And you went to Indonesia. Yes. That's a great choice. <laughs> great. And then, well, it's just Denmark. That's so far, like 18 hours from Indonesia. Uh, well, I mean, it started when um, uh, it was an interview. Like um, During the semester break, there was an interview invite. Um, 
and it was to go here to Denmark. And so I decided to take my chances and go to that interview because I thought the Europe is really cool and especially Denmark is also one of the Scandinavian countries, which I really find really cool. It's really different than Indonesia. And also similar to Elena, I've never actually been out of Asia before. And so I thought going to Europe, going far away from my family, it would be a really cool change. It will be a cool challenge too. And so, yeah, I decided to go here. So you want to feel a new experience, but it's still not when you went there, you feel a whole new experience, which is we face now the pandemic. We never know Ooh. it will happen, right? But yeah. how do you do there now? Elena in Indonesia and Iran in Denmark with the pandemic, is it in Indonesia we know they do the social distancing and you cannot go out, but did you go to somewhere before this or do you just stay in your apartment for Elena? Um, I do stay most of the time in the apartment. I did manage, I think, a week or two. Um, the very first weeks being here when we had the, you know, the introduction activities with the students, we did manage to go around Jakarta and see a few things. I saw the malls, I liked the malls. Uh, and now, yeah, with them being shut down, it's mostly indoors. And we do sometimes go for a walk around the block uh, just to get some uh, fresh air and a bit of sun. Uh, I must say, I do miss going to a park or walking on a sidewalk. Like in, I feel like in Jakarta, you don't, uh, it's not that common to just go for a walk on like a main street or in a park. Um, especially now with Corona. Um, so yeah, I'm mostly indoors, but it's all right because my roommate is an Indonesian LSPR student. So I feel like I still get that, uh, experience because I hang out with her and she's telling me about Indonesia and the culture and the costumes and we share a lot of things. So that's still great for me. So you made a new best friend and Iran, because yeah. Denmark is locked down, what did you do there now? Did you stay in the um, apartment or? Um, well, yeah, Denmark is in lockdown. But see, the thing is with Denmark's lockdown is that they don't actually prevent you from going outside. So all the stores are closed except for supermarkets at first uh, during the first phase of the lockdown. But if people want to go out to the parks or to just take a walk, it is actually still allowed as long as they keep distance from each other. And um, also before the whole pandemic happened, we did get to explore the city. We get to explore Copenhagen as well. And also me and my, uh, the other exchange students actually did get to go to Norway for a weekend. So that was really cool. And then like two weeks after we went there, the corona thing happened and we went on lockdown. And it was pretty rough, I guess, because everyone actually went back to their own countries. So it was really quiet here now. But um, a couple weeks ago, when the lockdown was eased up, uh, the international ambassador here actually took us to go to uh, another city tour in Copenhagen this time. And so we uh, we still got to explore um, Denmark, at least in this lockdown. It's not... Um, it's not, really it's okay. not prevented, I guess, yeah. So Erin can feel the Copenhagen, Elena can feel the Jakarta for five and Bali, Bandung, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah, we had that trip to Bandung, that was amazing. Like, we were not expecting such a VIP treatment. That was really lovely. And it was funny because before going to Bandung, uh, all the, like, LSBR staff was telling us that it's cold, you know, make sure to get a jacket and long pants. And us, we were like, haha, yeah, of course, it's cold for you, it's going to be fine for us. And we got to Bandung, and it was cold. So it was cold. It was cold at night. Yes. And we were all in shorts and tank tops and uh, short sleeves. And no, it was a bit, yeah. It was a bit terrible for us to get warm, um, but it was so much fun. We really enjoyed that. And the whole introduction week here offered by LSPR was a lot of fun. We managed to bond with each other as exchange students. And uh, since most of us are from the Netherlands, we can't wait to see each other again uh, when everything goes back to normal. So yeah, it was fun. So you'll meet them again. That was your, about your life. Now I want to ask about the study. Because of course you went to Denmark, you went to Indonesia for study, right? Before I ask about how to study during this pandemic, I want to ask first, what is the differences between the, between the education system in Indonesia in, with Netherlands and Indonesia with Denmark? What is the differences? Um, 
Should I? Yeah, Leila, can, you can go. <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't really have a bunch of offline courses here in NSPR, so it's a bit hard to compare. But I think from what I saw and what I heard, um, in the Netherlands, the courses are a bit more scattered in the week. Like you have a course on Monday and then two on Tuesday and then maybe one on Wednesday. And in NSPR, <clears throat> sorry. And then it's PR, it's a bit more organized and structured, like you have a specific number of classes each day. Um, so that's a bit more organized, I'd say. And then I think in the Netherlands, they rely more on self-study because there's uh, a lot more um, information that the teacher gives you in class. And then um, you're encouraged to put a lot of hours into studying by yourself, whereas in Indonesia and in LSPR, um, I think it's a lot less information and uh, you don't really need to go over it again after class because you kind of understand it already and it's clear in your mind. Um, yeah, so I'd say that's it. Yeah, it's a bit less demanding in LSPR, but it's easier to comprehend. Okay, and what about with that part? Um, um, like Elena said, the schedule is really different. Um, the schedule in LSPR, as we know, is really structured. While in Denmark, it changed from from day to day, really. No day is really um, the same. So we need to check our schedules every single day, or at least once a week. Um, and also, the, the, learning, the learning type is really different, as um, from what I have experienced here. They have assignments. They do it in groups every single time. Like this whole semester so far, there's, there has only been one individual assignment. So um, it is really important to make friends, to work well with other people, to do well. And especially since the assignment, most of them has to be done in that same day. And everybody has to do a presentation after um, the end of the class. So it was really um, interesting, but it is also, um, I find it beneficial for us because it allows us to explore more about the theories that the teachers have um, taught us. And it um, opens opportunities for discussions, for you know, just exploring your thinking and learning to work fast. So there's that. And also, the difference is that they don't really grade you for anything during the whole semester. They only grade you for the final exam. So in a way, it is kind of relieving that they allow you to just develop yourself during the whole semester. But also, I think it's it kind of puts a lot of pressure during the final exam since you really have to do good there. Yeah, there's a difference. So as I can say that uh, in LSD or Indonesia, the teacher more tell you about what to do, about the topic, you know, uh, maybe in Europe, this, the lecturer asks you to do more research on your own. But, but with that, kind of differences did this how do you cope with it like how can you catch up catch up because it's so different like Elena said before in, in LSB even though it's different like the lecture you need to attend the class you need to pay attention to the lecture because or you will miss everything because the lecture told you everything how do you catch up with that um um, to be honest, sometimes I get a bit uh, demotivated with the online classes in NSPR because I'm used from the Netherlands to receive a lot of information and put a lot of effort into studying. And uh, sometimes here, I told you, it's not the same amount of uh, knowledge and content that you get from the teacher. Um, so it's a bit like, yeah, I'm used to I'm used to studying and I'm used to putting a lot of thought into them. And now it's not really like that. So. I get a bit um, demotivated, but um, what I like to do is whenever I have an um, LSPR class, I like to go back to things I've studied before in the Netherlands and try to compare or add on to that or do more research on the side. So I think it's actually um, an incentive to look for more and to study more. So I think that's, yeah, that's nice on my part. Um, I think that's it, yeah. Ira? Mm, for me to cope is, I don't know, it's, um, I guess it 
it requires you to be more independent, I guess, because the teacher um, only basically give you an instruction of what to do. And it's really up to you and your group to how to work around that um, instruction. So you really need to, um, first of all, maybe come prepared to the class because they have also made a, made a kind of a module of what the reading materials for each meetings. So it is, I find it really beneficial for you to read that beforehand, before coming to class. So you'll know what to do, what to expect, and maybe what to explore as well. Um, yeah, basically that, be prepared and explore all possibilities of what to talk about. And for LSVR, we know that it's turned into an online session for Elena, but what, is, what about in Ziba? How they do with the pandemic? Do they have still class or do they have online class or they just give you assignment to them? Mm, they do still have online classes and they do give us um, assignments too, but that all depends on the teacher. Some of the teachers still apply the learning method like when we're in offline classes, which is, um, so they basically split us to, into groups and we have to do a presentation right away in that day, that day too. But some of the teachers are more lenient and they make it as a homework. So we present maybe one week or two weeks after that. But it is still the same. It's still online classes. And they don't just give us assignments to do. They still have um, lecturing, online lecturing, and online projects as well. So you have online projects, online classes. And is it a group project or is it a personal, personal project? It is still a group project. So that was a challenge in itself, too. How, yeah. how do you contact with your friend? Because you cannot meet them. And maybe some of your friends already went back to the wrong country because in Denmark there's a lot of international students also, right? How, yeah. how can you contact with the group? Um, so with the group is that um, we really, it's more like we decide on what time and what day that we need to do a Zoom meeting to talk about the assignments and to do it. Um, it is really, I know it's really more challenging because the discussions don't really flow as well as if we are meeting in person, but, but it works. And so far, the problem is really just the communication part, but there's nothing else. The challenge is not more than that most days. So everything's still fine until now? It is everything is still fine right now. Yeah. What about Elena? Is everything still fine until now? Sorry? Is everything still fine with you? What Do you have group project or is it all personal? Because you um, this week, right? Yeah, it's um, it's mostly mostly personal, but we do have a few uh, group things and it's usually the exchange students in a group. Um, which, yeah, kind of defeats the purpose of the Indonesian experience, but it's also easier for us to communicate with each other, especially because it's everything online, so that helps us. Um, yeah, our only a bit disappointment as exchange students, because I think because of Corona and because everything moved online, the courses that we could take are mostly, I wouldn't say first year, but beginner level. And back home in the Netherlands, we're already like second or third, uh, in our second or third year of university. So, yeah, that's a bit of a, um, not necessarily disappointment, but um, some things we have already done. Uh, so we were looking to do them more in depth or do something else, but that was unfortunately not an option. But then again, that's because of the situation and the context we're in. But we make the best and we try to keep ourselves busy with um, other activities, other personal projects, and self-development stuff, so it's all good. So your group is on, all from the HA student, or do you have some Indonesian students group? For, for one course, it's just exchange. Um, for other courses that I'm not in, but what I know from my uh, fellow exchange students, there is a mix of Indonesian, like LSDR and exchange. So yeah, it really depends. It's up to every course. What do you think working with Indonesian students? Sorry? What do you think working with Indonesian students in one group? I I don't have that experience. Um, but I think I think it's difficult with uh, the language barrier. And um, I think us 
from because we studied in the Netherlands, we're used to being more direct and we're used to speak up. And I think sometimes Indonesians might get that as uh, offensive or a bit too harsh because you're also, uh, I mean, not all, I'm not going to generalize, but um, um, yeah, I think they might get sometimes offended. I think that's the case. Um, but yeah, it's, it's two cultures working together. So there's a lot of effort to be put into um, adapting yourself to the other culture and working it together. But as I said, personally, I don't, I haven't worked in a group with Indonesia, so I can't say too much. And Iren, you work with mm -hmm. a student from another country as well. What do you think mm -hmm. working with them? What is the difference in working with fellow Indonesian students? Mm. The difference is, of course, yeah, the language barrier. It is, um, since it's, um, international students from a lot of countries with a lot of different um, learning backgrounds, different language backgrounds, backgrounds as well. Sometimes for one assignment that we understand it differently from person to person. And so it is kind of a challenge that we need to at least make a middle ground of what we have to agree on something to do because we understand it differently. Um, and, and yeah, it is actually, like Elena said, it was, um, it's not, they don't really speak up actually for, for us that, I don't know, we tend to, from what I feel, we tend to keep um, the peace, I guess, so we don't really speak up if we don't agree with someone or whatever. And so, yeah, that was a, a really kind of a challenge and it takes some time to get used to. But once we have the dynamic, we have the dynamic figured out, it was really easy actually to work with them. It was not a, much of a challenge. Yeah. So basically with your academic, it's not much challenge you face, except for the online thing mm -hmm. and the pandemic, you cannot do much. And Elena, you cannot feel the class atmosphere in LSPR, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what I miss because in high school in Romania, you had that, I had that community feeling with my classmates that I would see every day. In The Hague, I didn't really get that because the classes are so scattered and everyone's doing their own thing and it's a lot of workload. And I was kind of excited with LSBR because it feels like that high school uh, that high school vibe atmosphere in class where you get along with everyone and you talk all the time. And yeah, it really is a shame that I don't get to experience that. Maybe hopefully at one point before I leave, but you may never know. Yeah, you, you mm -hmm. still have like a half semester before you go, so think about yeah. it. Exactly, exactly. But do you guys find any challenges during this pandemic as a student exchange student? Maybe it's hard for you to find, like you cannot go out, of course. You cannot, maybe you have a plan to go trip, like either maybe to trip to Europe and Elena maybe to go around in Asia. Do you have any challenges beside the academic side? Um, well, yeah, we all had plans to. I personally wanted to do the performance arts part in LSPR, so that didn't happen. And then non-academically, uh, yeah, we had plans for traveling. We wanted to go around and see Indonesia and go to as many islands as we can. Um, and yeah, we just wanted to, to explore the country. So that, yeah, unfortunately can happen right now. And it's a disappointment. Um, yeah, I wanted to see places, I wanted to get to know people, to make friends. Um, and I did make a few friends, but right now it's kind of impossible. That's really a shame. I'm do, um, most of us were kind of lucky because we did go to uh, Bali and the Hili Islands and Lombok before um, everything started, before uni was supposed to start in LSPR. So at least we got that out of the way. But yeah, still. So. Um, staying indoors, it's really unfortunate because you come here for the cultural experience and you don't really get that for it. That's a shame. And Irene? Yeah, for me, for me it's pretty much um, the same too. Since um, the, the other exchange students, really, we, we plan to go around Europe during the, the Easter break, which was, which happens in um, early April, but then in mid-March, we started on lockdown and everyone started to go back to their own countries. And so we didn't really get to experience that 
um, the most that we can do is that we went to other cities like Copenhagen um, during the, the pandemic. And also the other challenges is that, yeah, we get really bored. There's nothing really, there's not much to do. So we didn't get to socialize much. We didn't get to meet other people, uh, except for the friends that we have encountered before the pandemic happened. And yeah, so it's not really much of a cultural experience here since nobody's out and there's not much to do. So that's a shame. Yeah, and we're also struggling financially, I think, both of us. We're all the students in our exchange. Um, yeah. Because it's the difference in currency and, um, yeah, whenever you go buy groceries, it's just hard to keep track of expenses. And the exchange students from abroad that had to go back home, they spent so much money on plane tickets, so much money, and accommodation and everything and transport. And, yeah, it's just a challenge. Um, also that we can't really have jobs at the moment and our parents are also struggling with their jobs. So that's definitely a main thing. Yeah. So financially, of, of course, everyone is affected. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And I want to encourage everyone, if you want to ask a question to Iren or to mm -hmm. Ellen, I can feel free to just drop the question in the chat box. I will ask them later. You can even Ask in Bahasa, I can translate it for them. And Iran can speak Bahasa. So I can translate for Iran. And that's the challenging, like you cannot, you travel, you financially, but what is, what about your daily? Like, is it easy to buy food? It, or is it hard, like the groceries? Because I know some countries, everything is sold out. There's nothing in the supermarket. You cannot find anything. What about in Denmark and Indonesia, from your perspective? In Denmark, actually, it was pretty good. Um, at, on the first few days of the lockdown, people were panic buying, um, of course. So actually, during those few days, I tend to avoid the grocery store because I don't really want to be caught up in the middle of the craziness. Um, but when I did go to a grocery store, actually, nothing is really out of stock. Well, some of the, some of the things are um, harder to find, but... Um, you know, there are still other substitutes, there are still other food that we can get. Um, so yeah, for daily life, actually, it wasn't really, uh, it wasn't really hard since people starting to realize that there's no use on panic buying and everything was in order. So it was actually pretty nice how Denmark handled all that. So, yeah. And Elena? Um, I think, yeah, you all know in Indonesia, I think they put in some uh, regulations when it all began uh, to avoid panic buying. So I'm not sure, but I haven't really seen an issue with that. However, it gets a bit scary because to get to a supermarket or a grocery store, you need to get in a uh, Grab or go cart. And you, you don't know where the driver has been, you don't know what people have been in it. Um, so that's the scary part with the virus going around. Um, but, but it's still okay, it's still manageable. It's not like we go every day, so it's all right. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think our, our everyday routines, uh, for everyone actually, um, it, everything flipped and, um, I have a personal issue because I don't have a routine anymore. Like I go, I'll go to bed whenever I want and everything just gets like mixed together. Um, and it makes me a bit unproductive. So I think in these times it's really good to uh, set an alarm in the morning and take a shower and have your breakfast and try to organize your day. That gives a bit more sense to what you're doing because sometimes I don't know what day of the week it is, what's going on, what am I supposed to do, deadlines and stuff. So yeah, it's, uh, it's a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> so yeah, definitely staying organized and productive when you're constantly indoors. Yes. It's a challenge. Facing so many challenges. This, this is a question for Elena. Because I know Iran, I know Iran answer for this. But for Elena, why you still choose to stay in Indonesia despite all the things happening when and most of your friends going back to their home? But why are you still staying here? Um I stayed 
for a few reasons. First of all, I didn't feel comfortable traveling on a plane for so many hours back home when everything was going crazy with the virus. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I told you I was lucky to have found a Indonesian LSPR stu uh, roommate that I could live with. So I was like, hey, you know, okay, I can't get out of the house, I can't travel around, but I can still hang out with this person and their friends and uh, find out more about Indonesia and get to know them better and see the cultural differences. So I felt like instead of um, going home and being, let's say, with my parents or on my own in the Netherlands, um, I thought that maybe I could make the best of staying here um, and just hope for the best. But so what is your parent reaction? How, how is their, their reaction? Because as parents, maybe they will be like, freak out, oh, my daughter is somewhere so far away. This is also a question for Iren, like 18 hours from home. Yeah, my parents were definitely worried, but both of them told me that, yeah, it's best to just stay put that safest. Um, and um, yeah, they were worried and they wanted to know what's going on. And it's, of course, it's hard for a parent. You have your kid like halfway across the globe. You don't know what's going on. You don't know what they're doing. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they're the ones who encouraged me to stay um, in my own business here. So that was kind of nice. I didn't have any conflicts with them. Whereas I know from other exchange students or just students in general, that there was a lot of conflict with their parents, you know, differences of opinion and what they should do. Uh, so I was quite lucky from that point of view. And what about Iran? Because you cannot go back now to Indonesia, all the plan is closed. Yeah, well, my parents actually, I think I have the most chill parents ever because they don't really comment much on it. They were just, oh yeah, how's the situation there? Just don't forget to take your vitamins, you know, take care of your health and just don't go outside too much. That's all they say. They didn't really comment on anything more. So yeah, they're really chill. But yeah, I was really lucky that um, my parents don't really make a huge deal out of it. They don't, they don't freak out, tell me, just go home quick now. They don't really do that. So it was really nice that I have a parent that is really supportive of me going here and yeah, just doing whatever I'm doing right now. So chill. Yeah. Uh, talking about family, we have a question from Agnes here. She asks, uh, to both of you, do you ever miss your friends or family in your home country? If yes, how do you deal with that? Mm. <laughs> you want to go, Arby? <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. Um, yes, of course, I do miss my friends and family. Um, Actually, for um, both of them, for the my family and my friends, I do have um, some video calls with them sometimes. Mm -hmm. And also for my friends, of course, I think Agnes knows it well because I have video called her also before <laughs> and with the other friends. So yeah, um, to deal with them, it's just I think that it is important to stay connected with them, to um, check out on them once in a while, to know how they're doing and to support each other really um like encourage the other when they have some difficulties in staying motivated and whatever it's nice to have them to talk about your struggles at least you know that you're not alone yeah true yeah i don't want to sound mean but i don't really miss my family because i'm used to living away from them um uh, for more than six months uh so that's not really an issue, but yeah, my friends, uh, people that I've known since high, since high school or middle school, people that I've known for 10 years and we were living together and hanging out all the time together. And yeah, I do, I do miss them, but as Irene said, we do have video calls and we play games together and we try to keep up the, the, like, the relationships that we have with each other. So that's good. But at the same time, I also made friends here. So I'm trying to focus on friendships right now because I know the ones from back home will stay, but I'm trying to make the ones here as good as possible so they can last as well. Especially because my roommate and her sister are supposed to come on exchange today from September. Hopefully they'll be able to. So that will be literally one full year of us hanging out together. And I really value that. And I'm really happy that's happening. Yeah. Uh, continuing with what Ellen is 
about having a friend, like a local friend. I have a question from Karen here. He asked, before both of you say that language barriers is the problem for the communication with the local student or with just basically with the local people, that makes, that makes her curious. So do you take some time to study the language? Like uh, Irene studying the Danish or Elena studying Bahasa, did you try to learn? Um, I heard, I was told Bahasa is not extremely difficult to learn. So there is a part of me that wants to study it and of course become amazingly fluent in it by the time I leave. Um, but to be honest, I think the key to actually getting to know a culture and the locals is learning their language. Um, and that's the only way you can like truly communicate with them. Um, and here in Indonesia, especially, um, I do feel like I want to learn Bahasa or just a few words to be able to actually talk to people and uh, have some nice discussions. I mean, the people I do hang out with, they do speak English, but still, um, Bahasa is their native one. So that's always nice. Even me, um, I do speak English and I've been speaking my whole life, but I do feel most comfortable in Romanian and I feel like my personality truly really shows <clears throat> in Romanian rather than English. So what Bahasa have you learned so far? The word in Bahasa? Oh, yeah. yeah, I know like terima kasih, sama sama, the, the usual. I know some bad words that I won't say here. Um, what else? Yeah, that, that's kind of it, just to like get around. I know Dimana for uh, like directions and everything. Yeah, just a few a few scattered words here and there. This that's a lot. <laughs> Learn your own. Yeah. And Iren, besides tuck. Because this <laughs> Besides tuck, um, I know several words that I always encounter when I'm I'm buying food. Basically my my vocabulary is kind of basically limited to food. Like, um, for example, um, to get chicken, I noticed um, peeling and um, <laughs> what else? <laughs> I don't know, and pasta, leaves, I don't know, there's yeah, several random words that I get because I have been looking at food labels for a long time now. Uh, and probably like, good morning, like, good morning, and... See, they have a really weird accent, the way that they talk. It's really, you know, I, I did try to learn the language before coming here. But you know what, I, I find it, it's kind of fruitless, I suppose, because I'm not really staying here for that long. And it's not enough for me to learn the language since the way that they talk is really, and you cannot really understand them unless I think you've been living here for years. So yeah. I mostly stick to speaking English, and I'm really lucky that Danish people actually speak English. So, yeah. But do, do both of you ever encounter a situation where you would talk with the locals or with students, but they cannot speak in English before? Like, in mm -hmm. the, the people can speak in English, but maybe you find someone counter situation that they only can still speak Danish. Mm. I have several people from my dorms that um, I have talked to before that they don't really speak English. Um, but mm -hmm. um, we were lucky that we were speaking in like a group. So there's this one person that keeps translating back and forth from English to Danish. Um, but yeah, but if it was just the two of us and, and the, the person doesn't really talk English, I have never encountered that, luckily. Elena? Because Indonesian people, they don't speak English too much. Yeah, I had, I had no issues in university or with the classmates. That's totally fine. But in stores or at the reception in the building, yeah, it's always a problem. I try my best. I pull up the Google Translate and I show them what I want. But then when they talk to me, I don't understand. And it's always like sign language. But it's, uh, it's fun. It's funny stories. It's nothing annoying about it. Um, it's just, uh, yeah, it's nice. It's funny. Um, and I like that. But yeah, I usually in stores when I want to buy something or when I'm looking for something. But now hopefully I know a few words so I can kind of hint at what I want so that helps. 
Okay, let's move on to another question from Ilona. <laughs> Hello, Irene and Elena. During this pandemic, do you guys feel want to go back to your homeland in the middle of this uncertainty situation? So, do you want to go back to the or do you want to go back to Netherlands or Romania? Um, I am missing the Netherlands a bit, I must say. Uh, especially the city I was living in, The Hague. It's a really pretty city. Um, and I do miss that sometimes. Um, as I told you, the walking through the city center or going to the beach or just sitting in a park on a bench. Um, I do miss that. Uh, but it never gets to me because I know that I'm going to be here six months and then I'm going back. So it's not like I've left forever. Um, I did almost cry once, but it's okay. We all have a weak moment. It's fine. And you, yeah. you want to come back here to end the I am the pregnant thing? Oh, God, why do you have to bring that up? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, on some days, yeah especially when people um, was going back to their own countries once uh, when the lockdown first started. And I checked the flight to Indonesia and it actually was cheaper than ever. So I was like, hi, it would be pretty funny if I go back for a week, maybe just to eat whatever I want to eat, the Indonesian food cravings. It's really hard to recreate here. Uh, but then I thought again that the situation could be even worse if I leave. So, yeah, I decided to stick around here because I also still have some friends that haven't left yet and I want to make the most out of, um, like, you know, spending time with them, um, living differently. And also, I would like to make the most out of the clean air, taking walks in the clean air, really. It's, it's a really, it's a breath of a fresh air, literally. And yeah. It was nice. It's nice living here. So the thought has come, but yeah, it was as Elena said. I'm 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 gonna be back there in a few months anyway. So yeah. So just fill your lungs with the clean air, eating all the healthy food there first, and Elena, you can fill your lungs, your lungs with what. <laughs> <laughs> and this question is from Satriani. For both speaker, how about your learning activity during this pandemic? What is unique? What did you do when our film is coming? What do you do when you work doing the online session and everything? Hmm. I can't say anything is unique. Oh, sorry. No, 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 go ahead. Oh, yeah, I can't really say anything is unique because I think all over the world is still online sessions everywhere. Um, but when I get bored, huh, it's an interesting question because I don't really have an answer to this. When I get bored, I just remind myself that, um, that this is a responsibility that I have to take, that this is what I signed up for, and uh, it's really stupid if I have to mm -hmm. give up on missing deadlines and everything just because I got bored. And besides, everyone is going through this. So if one of them, if one of us gives up, I think it, it really will give up negative energy. And you know, there's no use in dwelling on the negative thoughts, I guess. So it's nice to say to motivate yourself by, I don't know. For me, I tend to give myself little rewards, I suppose, after doing something. Like, I don't know, eating my favorite food after doing an assignment or going out of our walks or after an assignment. So having something to look forward to, it really um, helps me to get through the boredom. Yeah, I totally agree with Irene. And that was really nice to say. Um, what I think is different for me is that I'm getting a change of perspective because I left home. Um, so I'm starting to see um, the courses that I'm doing or my future career, I have a different perspective on that and I can look at the big picture. And I think that's maybe useful for all of us in this time to take a step back, uh, take a breath of fresh air and uh, just try to figure out what we're going to do in the future and try to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Um, 
because yeah, at the moment I'm looking at different possibilities. I'm thinking of a future career uh, that could, um, you know, like what if Corona happened when I had a job, thinking of a job that could be adapted to situations like that and thinking of how I could help. So I think, I think it's good to kind of put everything on, on pause for a few months and in standby and to see the bigger picture. So that's kind of mm -hmm. what changed. Our speaker today is so positive, yeah, guys. Like, one of them is so positive about it. And this is the question I think a lot of people want to know. This is to I to Iran. As we know that you you are choosing the the scholarship recipient from Erasmus Plus, which will get a uh, monthly funds and also the transportation funds and everything. Do you have like tips and tricks for it? And also maybe you can tell a little bit story how you can get chosen to be the recipe, like one, only one from like thousand people. <laughs> huh. um, for me, it was, um, it was during in the middle of um, the semester break. I, I still remember I was lying in my bed because I had nothing to do during the break. And then suddenly I got an email saying that um, I was um, one of the Chinese people that have the opportunity to um, go on an interview to go to uh, to here to Zbat and receive the Erasmus Plus scholarship. And at first, I was kind of hesitant because I felt like, is this a scam or something? And yeah, the thought has come to my mind. But then I looked at um, the the sender of the email. It was from LSPR, and it looked legit. And some of them. One of my friends actually got that email too. So yeah, we went for the interview and um, we had to also make an essay on marketing. Um, and suddenly I was chosen. So um, I don't know what the tips on the tricks. I think it's just um, like prepare your best, giving your best in all the process and yeah, giving your best, I suppose, and take all the opportunities that you have. Is it hard to get accepted? Uh, I don't know if it's <laughs> I don't really know how to answer that. Is it hard? Uh, hmm. Is it hard? I guess. Uh, in a way it is, and in another way it isn't. Uh, hmm. So as long as you do your best, yeah, let God do the rest. <laughs> basically, yeah. But awesome. Then, uh, basically, this is also the question from one of the viewers today. They want to know the precise information on story or on how both of you have chosen to study abroad, like Iran to Denmark and Lana to the Hague. From the head, is it hard? Like, do you choose the country or the school choose choose it for you, Elena? Um, yeah, you have a list of countries. You can only choose one country outside of Europe. So you make a nice list of, I think, five or six countries. I think five. Um, and then um, you, of course, you submit your CV and other stuff. And uh, there's a ranking of the students based on the credits they have. So not necessarily based on grades, but on the number of credits. Um, and it's three separate categories. So if you're in the first category and you have all your credits, you have priority. Um, and it's usually, yeah, it's a bit competitive because it's one or two spots maybe per uh, country, per university. Um, so you really have to make sure you get all your exams and you pass everything. So you have the number of credits and uh, your chances of getting there increase. Um, but I personally, I don't think I had to take any uh, examination or write the paper like Irving did. Um, it was mostly just, yeah, CV and I think maybe a letter, a cover letter, but I'm not, I'm not sure anymore. But yeah, usually academic performance um, helps a lot in securing a place wherever you want to go. So it's, it's almost the same like in LSPR. So let me do a little bit of explanation on how the LSPR student can choose to do the exchange program or study abroad program. First of all, you need to be LSPR student. 
if you want to go abroad from LSPR side, you need to be LSPR student. You will go on the fifth semester or sixth, like Iran, if something special happens, uh, or fourth, fourth or five, sorry. Uh, then uh, there is minimum GPA. You need to pass the English assessment, and we will explain the rest later. So just make sure to always follow international office information from our Instagram at lsvr.international. Oh, let me do the shameless advertising, guys. <laughs> so just make sure uh, to listen. If there is so someone to go to your class in your third semester, we will give the information. Yeah. And for Erasmus Plus, everyone can have a change, like Iran, to get the Erasmus Plus scholarship. But again, it's not an easy one, but it doesn't mean it's hard. Yeah, it's hard, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard, but it's not that hard. You can do it. And this is the question from our audience. The last question from our audience is from Karen again. Uh, she asks, the part of learning a country color is knowing their cuisine. Two, so how do you both adapt to the food in Denmark and Indonesia? Like in Denmark, I know... There's no taste in it, it's only salt and pepper, there's nothing inside it, <laughs> just that. You know, Indonesia, maybe different from Netherlands, it's spicy, there's so many spices in it. How do you adapt with the food? Or do you just eat bread every day? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, coming from the Netherlands, um, yeah, it, it's really spicy here, it can get too spicy for my taste. But then again, I'm originally Romanian, and we also use a lot of spices. So it was a nice change from the bread and butter and cheese of the Netherlands to something that has a bit more flavor. Um, but I really, I really enjoy it. I really, really enjoy it. I really like it. And um, my student buddy showed me a bunch of stuff, and we were also supposed to do a street food trip, um, but that didn't happen because of some floods and then Corona and everything. Uh, but I really enjoy it. I have a newly found passion for Indomie, which I know is not healthy, but it just works. Um, and yeah, no, it's nice to, it's also nice to see a few uh, tips and tricks from the cuisine here. So I'm sure when I go back to Europe, I'll still be cooking, um, not necessarily Indonesian food, but uh, with Indonesian uh, aspects and flavors in it. Aspects. What is your favorite mm -hmm. Indonesian food? My favorite, uh, um, um, nasi, nasi goreng, is that the fried noodles with seafood? Yeah, I love that. I absolutely love that. And Iren, with the Danish food? Uh, Danish food, they are, mm, they're not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, they're, they're, no, they're, they are actually not that bad. I was actually surprised because, yeah, Kabutri told me before before I came here actually that they don't have taste. Um, I find that sometimes it is true, but sometimes it's not. Apparently, they don't really cook. They don't only cook with salt and pepper. Sometimes they eat, they cook curry too, which comes to a surprise for me. But um, um, I mostly eat food from uh, from my dorm's food hall um, during the day and during the weekdays. Um, sometimes they do a good job, sometimes they don't, but it is still bearable, it is still edible for the whole, um, you know, generally. Um, but say if you are, I find it if you are getting attached to rice, it is kind of hard because they don't really eat a lot of rice here. Sometimes they do eat it, but it's not... It's not every day, it's not for every meal, so I guess you need to get used to eating more potatoes and pasta. Um, uh, I don't know. The food for me, it's not really something that I, I struggle with to get used to. Oh, also, if you like spicy food, it's hard because they don't do a lot of spicy here. Um, like one day I cooked something, I didn't really put any chili, I was just putting salt and pepper and my friend complained that it was too spicy and I was like, I didn't even put any chili in it and they complained for it, so yeah. It's just hard if you get attached to rice and spicy food, but other than that, I think it'll be fine. Your favorite Danish food? Small pork? <laughs> I 
actually don't really like that one. It's kind of weird. Okay. Yeah, I don't well, know. Which... Please don't say Brad, because you also have it here. Yeah. Um, actually, the thing that I have come to like here. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think it's really Danish food. I, I really enjoy eating in the one of those Turkish places when they sell kebab and pizza. Actually, that's my favorite food to eat here. It's not really the Danish cuisine, actually. Like their, seafood is, <laughs> their seafood is pretty good, actually. Yeah, their seafood is nice. Okay, so the kebab. I, I'm also confused, actually, like, is it kebab Danish special food or no? Because it's everywhere in Denmark. <laughs> Every quarter, yes. It's not like a special food when it's, it's come from Arab or something. <laughs> then, yeah. this will be my last two questions. Uh, you can answer uh, together, like, what is your tips and trick to survive while studying abroad? And what is the greatest lesson you've learned during this experience? Who wants to answer first? Um, I think I can go first. Mm -hmm. um, so tips and tricks for the best study exchange experience, right? Yep. Um, I think being extremely open to anything and going out of your comfort zone, uh, not sticking to the routine and habits you had back home, but adapting to the ones here. Like um, whatever food or whatever cuisine I like change at home or whatever habits and uh, leisure activities I had at home, I like to uh, get rid of them and find some new ones here. Be, be sociable, try to be out there, outgoing, uh, interact with people, get to know them as good as possible, spend time with them, travel as much as you can. Um, so I think, yeah, those are kind of tips and tricks, just out of your comfort zone and experience everything. And the greatest lesson learned? Greatest lesson, uh, to be more outgoing, because I do have the tendency to uh, stick to myself and be a bit, I want to say introverted, but a bit more, yeah, me with myself. And being here, uh, I realized that there's no point in that, uh, that I should be out there and do whatever I want and so experience life to the fullest. So I think that's it. Ira? Mm -hmm. um, for me, yeah, I, I agree with Elena that you need to be more open to other people. And, you know, I think it's really important to not stick to yourself, but to make as many friends as possible, do as many things that you can with them. And, you know, it's a really new situation and having people that can, um, that can go through it with you together, it's really nice to share, kind of share the burden um, and to have fun as much as possible, um, explore new things as much as possible. And also, I think it is important to be prepared as like, um, obviously you cannot really expect 100% of what's happening, but I find it uh, um, easier to when you know at least a little bit of what to expect. And sh like learning the language even for a little bit, I think it can be beneficial to to survive, especially if you need something in particular that you cannot really get, like like food allergies or whatever that you cannot um, just do whatever you like that actually does some harm to you. Really nice to know it in your um, in the language that you're staying in. And for the lesson that I have learned here, um, I got to experience the real like work hard and play hard too. <laughs> it is actually it's nice to know that there there can actually be a balance of that. Um, that you don't necessarily stressed out when you work hard and that you don't actually achieve nothing when you have fun it is um i find it that it's possible to do which is a really nice um, change that i could have um and also just hearing other perspectives of um facing life being more positive like yeah making connections with other people actually it's pretty it's something that I struggled with, but um, yeah, I like to think I've 
starting to get better in opening myself up with other people. So, so many lessons learned. And before we end this session, I want to probe about a little bit what we talked before the past one hour, what we talked for one hour already. <laughs> before we talk about the, the differences between Indonesia with Denmark or Indonesia with Netherlands, it's mostly with the air pollution, the traffic. <laughs> <laughs> but also there is the positive one like you can feel the differences of the culture you can know more people and from the academic side even though during this pandemic it's not easy like you cannot go to the class everything is online you need to do the group project meanwhile you're not you're not meeting them it's hard but it's still it's still fine so far right it's still okay and for the experience uh, as both of you said before, there's a lot to learn. And from this pandemic, we can learn that we need to be stay positive no matter what happens. So it will change your, just change your mindset to be more positive. And I want to ask everyone before we end it today, let's take a group photos together. And I will invite also my friends here, <laughs> my boss here, Ibu Kendi. <laughs> Please take a picture together with Mitsu here. <laughs> Hi, Miss Candy. Thank you so much, Elena and Irene. Thank you. Please turn on your camera, everyone. Let's take a picture. <laughs> Please, uh, we're still waiting for some people to turn on the camera first. It's okay, guys. Even though you already take a bath or no, it's okay. No <laughs> Very nice. Okay, one more. Okay. You know, count. One, two, three. <laughs> okay. Because we're not here. And Miss Kenny request from Miss Nadine Camera. Please, Miss Nadine. She wants to be in the frame. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Putri, for uh, being our moderator for today, and of course, to our special guest. I know um, our speakers right now, um, you've handled so much for the last few weeks, especially being stuck um, abroad in a, an, in a very unfamiliar country that you didn't expect. All of us didn't expect as well. And um, thank you for, for sticking up to it, for being positive, you know, for, you know, that you're staying there and um, you're still keeping in touch with us. And then you're not like the others where, okay, I give up. I don't want to study anymore or because, because of the pandemic, because of the ongoing pandemic. So um, I would like to thank you for your positivity and for continuing your studies because um, I couldn't imagine um, other students would have probably already stopped their studies because of the challenges, basically, because of the, the changes in, in academics, the, the shift to online. Um, it's, it's a challenge. But just by being abroad, I know it's a challenge for you too. And um, it's very, culture-wise, it's very different and you were able to adapt to it. So thank you and I hope you two will stay healthy and safe. And also you, Putri. <laughs> um, so to everyone, of course, our audience as well, please be safe. And just um, um, with our topic for today, if anyone who wanted to study abroad, as uh, Putri already mentioned a while ago, of course, you need to be a regular student of LSVR. And our next schedule mm -hmm. for sending students abroad is next year. Um, in September. So the registration would be during your semester three in the months of September and October. We will make sure that the international office representatives will be visiting your classes. Gabi Sangga, 100% um, pasti all third, year, uh, third semester students will visit your classes. If you will be absent on the day that you will be there and you're interested to, stu to study abroad or to join any of our international programs, please um, just send us a message in international office at lsbr.edu. So that would be the easiest way. You don't need to go to our office. You don't need to look for our contact numbers or hotline numbers. You can DM our Instagram, lsbr.international. 
um, we have our admin there who will be answering your inquiries. So there you go. Um, again, thank you to Elena and to Irene for being with us and also to Putri. Um, that ends our webinar session. That is our first leg of webinar session with our university partners. And please stay in touch with us. Follow LSP at LSPR Jakarta on Instagram and also LSPR.International for more updates, especially that we will be having a second leg of webinar series um, in the coming month of June after the adult holidays. And of course, it will be continuing in September in our next semester. All right, so I hope you guys will tune in with us for our next webinar series. Again, thank you to all our participants and please be safe everyone and be healthy. Thank you.